thank you very much. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time here. Thank you for the invitation. It's my first visit to San Sebastian, but I, I'm not sure I'll have much to say to the locals because I think that entrepreneurship seems to be quite alive and well here. I enjoyed the, um, the mantra yesterday in one of the presentations which said that entrepreneurial teachers and entrepreneurial schools make for more entrepreneurial students. And uh, actually, it's exactly uh, the case. That is exactly the case. Um, I work for Junior Achievement, JA for short. And uh, you might know us from your countries, uh, some of the local names, maybe Young Enterprise or uh, Injaz in the Middle East. Um, but it's a very large organization, a very large network. I represent the European region. The European region is bigger than the, uh, than the EU member states. We work in 40 European countries. And we are a non-profit organization. And we are the largest in Europe working in the space, specific space of entrepreneurship education, work readiness, and financial capability. And Next year we will be 100 years old, and I think what's interesting about that is not so much the 100 years, but where, where, uh, what you do with the next 100 years. And I think it's very true, and, and a lot of the discussion we've heard is that one of the things that's coming through VET, coming through academic streams, coming through our whole education system is this explosive need to react to well, we use the word entrepreneurship competence. Sounds a bit boring, a bit heavy. You can use a lot of other words for what we mean by that. I read a, a, a recent newspaper article. They called it grit. They just called it grit. And it's that adaptability, that perseverance. It's all that stuff, but it's all mixed together. And it's like a fireball coming through our school systems. Um, we work with public sector and private sector, so I think this is also another element of the business community, working with the education community, working with the government community and policymakers and NGOs, which, uh, which work in between and in the middle as intermediaries of various kinds. We're talking about vet schools, we're talking about academic schools, we're talking about primary, primary education, middle education, the whole thing. Um, I have my colleague here, Blanca Narvaez, who runs Junior Achievement in Spain. And Spain is a very big country. And then you have all of these very challenging situations in every single region with every, sing every single um, set of policymakers and institutions. Um, they are reaching 31,000 students here. And I also want to underline that in, in our philosophy, it's very important to engage schools directly with the business community. So she's working, for example, with 2,700 business volunteers every year in order to bring young people in connection with the business community, constantly mentoring, coaching, this working both in vet systems as well as in academic schools. So I've been working in this field for 25 years. And I worked locally in classrooms, but I also worked at the national level and the EU level and, and internationally and seen a lot of the com comparisons and the challenge, similar challenges regions are facing. Um, but I started my career in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, just after the wall came down. And at that time, entrepreneurship education or in a way, they treated it as market economics and, and bringing in this kind of new, new information into the school systems. It was seen as a rapid response strategy for economic development. Language teachers were involved. Economics teachers were involved. Science teachers were involved. So I'm not here to talk to you so much about, you might have thought, entrepreneurship development, you might have thought, oh, she's going to talk to us about microfinancing and incubators and startups. Well, no, I'm, I'm really here to talk to you about the beginning of the conversation for Industry 4.0. And in those days, back in Central and Eastern Europe, it was the beginning of the conversation for post-communist Europe. Um, entrepreneurship education plays an extremely important transformational role 
um, and education for entrepreneurship is, is the other side of the same coin. So I would talk a little bit more about economic policies and um, not so much about incentives or for would-be entrepreneurs. I want to explain how, for example, things like entrepreneurship education, and perhaps some of you in the field have witnessed this, how it can lower dropouts, how it can increase learning and motivation, how it can literally, if you look back long term, which we have done in some countries, they produce twice as many entrepreneurs, job creators later on. So, you know, some people say, uh, you're wrong, you know, entrepreneurs are born, they're not made. Well, we, we say they're born and made because you can incentivize and you can motivate young people to be more entrepreneurial, to choose entrepreneurship as a career path, but also to be more intrapreneurial, or you could call it being more enterprising within a company or contribute more value through innovation in a company. But at the same time, we also have to talk about what, how national education strategies are not keeping up, how they are not adapting, how they are not changing in order to build up that higher entrepreneurial potential. Do they see themselves as part of the story, part of the narrative in developing that entrepreneurial potential? You've seen it sometimes how there's a disconnect between what people do in school and what um, the economy wants. So, and, and again, this vet is far ahead of, of many uh, school uh, pathways in terms of this making this connection between the education path and the work experience path, but there is still much more to do. You had this conversation earlier in the conference about the robots and how they might be taking over, but it's not quite there yet. Um, but you've, I, I've met a lot of people with very interesting job titles, you know, evangelist, social media evangelist, or, or um, you know, mobile app um, uh, de developers. They have completely new job titles that wouldn't have been around 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, you talked a little bit about the World Economic Forum, 65%, that 65% of young people will be in jobs later that do not exist yet. Uh, but it's also the point of that is not so much about that problem, but it's about the fact that young people need to become job shapers and job creators and job designers. Uh, they have to create these roles for themselves as they freelance, as they build businesses, um, as, they, as they go in new directions. And you might be interested in this list. Um, in World Economic Forum 2015, they were looking at uh, these lists of top 10 skills, you see how they've kind of changed uh, now in 2020 where complex problem solving is number one. Uh, you guys here have been talking a lot about that. We see things like, we've, we, we, ha we talk all the time about reading and writing and, and numeracy, but there are other literacies now that are top of the list like financial literacy, like digital literacy. So. We really have to understand what literacies, what capabilities we should really be prioritizing. Um, so this issue of complex problem solving, yes, but they moved up critical thinking, they moved up creativity, they moved up collaboration, and they moved up emotional intelligence. And even though we will lose some of the automation, some of the uh, jobs because of automation, um, McKinsey estimates that half of all jobs will be automated by 2055. We still need to reinforce human capital with competences related to the co-creation project. I really liked what you have, have discussed about how important teams are, 
how important working with others and, and mixing and matching skills and competences in a group. That's one of the most highly motivating things that young, that young people can learn, but it's also one of the most challenging processes they can learn. Those teaming skills are not easy for artificial intelligence to replicate. And the World Economic Forum also has said that all of these skills that we're talking about here, these non-cognitive skills, these magic soft skills, um, for us, they're all in this realm of the entrepreneurship competence. And the European Commission has talked a lot about what makes up the magic entrepreneurship competence. And it's many of these things, if not all of these things. And what's striking is that creativity is now among the top skills and critical thinking is more important than coordinating others, as well as people management, which is complemented by emotional intelligence. Another list you might be interested in, um, you can't see so easily maybe from far back, but this is a survey done by PwC with CEOs, and it's a very nice deck. I think you can download it um, uh, from PwC if you're interested in but they're really talking about, they're, they're homing in on what is the crisis set of skills that we really need to, to look at, and it's, guess what? Problem solving, leadership, adaptability, creativity, and innovation. Those are the ones which the CEOs, 77% of them, said we are missing. The more we automate, the more we digitalize, the more important these become. And they said that even though they struggle to find recruits with these levels of these skills, they say that it's precisely these skills which are a risk, you know, the lack of them is a risk to their business success. So in a sense, there is this focus on, the, on human resource, despite the fact that all these companies are really focusing on automation and digital and all of these new, new things, they're also um, forced to be much more concerned about their human resources and the quality of their human capital. These are the most, at least in our opinion, some of the most elusive skills to cultivate and to develop. If you start too late, it's very hard to to crystallize those in, in people as they grow and as they go to school. So the earlier you start, the better. And this is the big conundrum, is how can you, this is a very complex problem that we all here are involved in solving, how can we foster those very elusive skills in a very effective way, using our institutional infrastructure to really get there What's the best way to do it? How, how do we measure success when maybe you're working with somebody who's 17 years old? How do you know that that's, in the end, is going to result in that magic PWC formula uh, of success? We are working in the right direction, though, I think. We've started broadly across all education systems to start thinking much better about competence-based learning. So the skills that we're talking about here are associated with the entrepreneurship competence. It's a relative newcomer to the, to the list of key competences in the, in the EU. Entrepreneurship competence was, I think, officially added in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but now it is much, there's much more energy behind it. There's much more investment behind it. There's much more attention on it. And it's held in much higher regard. I can remember when people told me that talking about this in school was bad, if not evil. That money, there was negative issues about having young people work, for example, with money or learning by doing uh, through very real enterprise experiences or entrepreneurial experiences. There was a lot of you know, pushback. That has completely changed. Things have really come around to realizing that this is not about that. This is about those very sexy competences that young people need to learn by doing, not by 
theory or by thinking. These are things they have to actually experience. Um, just to show you, there was a um, um, uh, Eurydice report. Uh, do, I don't know if you have read it, the Eurydice report on specifically on entrepreneurship education, where they talked about how many countries have really progressed in making this entrepreneurship competence a core piece of their national strategy. It's only 11 countries which have it as a comprehensive strategy from top to bottom and flowing all the way through their, their national education strategy. Another eight or nine have it as a priority here and there, and they're trying to work it through. But that's less than half of the member states. Um, but it is changing. 11, I thought, was fantastic given how relatively recent the entrance of entrepreneurship competence into the list was. Um, so we all agree that starting from a young age is very important. Reinforcing this over and over through a child's career, school career, is also important. You know, you can evaluate one learning experience, one course or one set of modules, but if you have multiple touch points, multiple engagements with this kind of, uh, with this kind of education, the impact has been shown to spiral over time, and those competences, the mastery of those competences, begins to spiral over time. It has much higher effect with multiple experiences than with only one. And it's also true that it doesn't really matter what country you're in. It's relevant, it works, and you can still achieve this impact. So it's really, systems might be different, but the fact of how to develop this competence best is something that's very transversal and very replicable. The involvement of others in the process with schools, not schools alone, but with the business community, with NGOs, with other actors in the community, that's also been seen to be fundamental. Why? because it creates alternative learning spaces, blended learning spaces, formal and informal, mixing and matching. Again, VET is quite good at this, but now it's a question of going even deeper to cultivate not just hard professional skills, but also these soft non-cognitive skills at the same time. There is also a big difference between learning about entrepreneurship or for entrepreneurship and learning through entrepreneurship. It's key because if you don't actually have that deep dive, intensive, real experience through an entrepreneurial practical um, case, then you really won't get it. You'll have a long distance view or maybe a superficial understanding of what it is, but you won't know, you won't gain that grit you won't gain that perseverance that you need if you really want to um, succeed. We did some research which might be helpful for you um, in your work. This was a large research project um, that lasted three years in five different countries. It involved 12,000 students. We involved also teachers and parents, the local community. We wanted to understand how entrepreneurship education impacts the 360 degrees of impact uh, around the experience that the students are having. Um, and we wanted to see, are they getting those highly desirable but highly elusive skills? And we also wanted to see what are the barriers, the hindrances, um, as well as the drivers in the system which are helping move these things forward. What's helping, what's not helping? Um, what we did was we took an exercise, which I think uh, Technica is doing some work in this area as well, where students are creating enterprises while they are at school. And we decided to take that kind of exercise, that kind of methodology, which is one of the most widespread and most effective available for schools, whether it's academic schools or vet schools. This methodology of, of student enterprises is, is a, one of the best methods known. 
And we decided to do a stress test on it. We called it a, our, our company program. And we decided to do a stress test on this to see, to look, to examine it, uh, these effects that, they, that it has. So uh, you're familiar probably with these kinds of uh, methods where the students begin with coming up with an idea, brainstorming, they, they get together in a team, they, they really decide what is the product, what is the service, what am I going to do, what is the business I'm going to create. We spend a lot of time on the ideation and the innovation process and how they come up with that idea because they really have to come up with something that's, that's going to work. So we really want them to, to go through a very long um, ideation process. Then they go to uh, production, they go to preparation, they go to market, they come up with the, uh, everything from a lean, a lean business plan, lean business canvas, all the way to, um, uh, to the final uh, marketplace. And we hope they make some money, we hope that they can distribute something to their shareholders. Um, it doesn't always happen. Um, and then we also have a lot of opportunities for them to go uh, into competitions um, and win all kinds of prizes for the kinds of businesses they have created. Could be a social enterprise, could be a, um, uh, could be a, a high tech business, could be arts uh, and uh, creative industries. There are many, many, many types of uh, products and services that they come up with. Um, in the survey, in the, sorry, in the research that we did, 70% of the students said they had spent more than 100 hours on this. So in the curriculum, and there were half of the schools involved were vet schools, half of the schools involved were not vet schools. And they, there were a certain number of hours built in already to the curriculum but the 100 hours was also what they reported on top that they spent on Saturday nights or on, on uh, you know, afternoons or extra time they spent because they really, really wanted to do well and they really wanted to succeed. So this, this 100 hours proved to be very, very important. This deep dive experience proved to be very important in the results. So that's high activity. So in the research, we said those who had that 100 hours or more, we called them high activity. And those who had this level of high activity, it was amazing all the other stuff that was going on with them. For example, you hear a lot of, if somebody's going to complain about entrepreneurship education, sometimes they will say, oh, they're spending so much time on this, they don't have time to learn math, or they don't have time to work on their other subjects, and you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, an opportunity cost. But neither the qualitative results, or the interviews that we did, nor the quantitative results, there was no evidence of that. There was only evidence that there were either that there were positive impacts um, from these 100 hours. They showed higher levels of motivation, higher levels of school performance and effort. They put more effort into it, and they, there were reduced absenteeism. That's that team effect, too. It's not cool if your team is working hard and you're staying at home and, and with your feet up on the couch. So this kind of challenge-based, uh, team-based, uh, learning really had an impact on the students' level of motivation and performance. Another thing, other competences benefited as well. So we saw that from an educator perspective at least, this was very important to see that there was increased performance or achievement in math, in digital, in civic competences, in language, so these were all collateral benefits or spin-off benefits from this kind of experience. They also said that they, the students understood why these other subjects were so important to learn. They understood the relevance of those subjects. And this is one of the challenges of secondary education often is the silos between subjects and people don't often connect the dots. Why am I doing this? Another thing is that they said they developed new attitudes about themselves. They realized maybe they didn't, they didn't know about talents that they had, 
Um, they also learned responsibility, courage, patience, proactivity, independence. That's that grit again. They learned that. And they said also the teachers mentioned that the schools started to develop strategies about this kind of activity. How can we support these kids more? This is working. How, what kind of things can we do? How can we involve more teachers? What kind of plans can we make? So in a way, it sort of galvanized, mobilized some of the overcoming of the hindrances in the system. One of the school uh, headmasters said, there was a lot of resistance among the teachers when we started our participation in this uh, research project. Um, and we would have, when we were told, we would have to increase the penetration, and this was what I said about the stress test, instead of having one group of students at the school participate in this, we actually had 50% of the students at the school participate so that we could really see what happens in the school environment. At the end of the project, I thought all the teachers would say, no way, thanks, I'm going to be uh, uh, happy to go back to my normal job. But when I asked them, they all wanted to continue offering this activity to the students. So obviously, there were all other kinds of spin-off impact in terms of the way the school was organized. And the EU would like to see that every young person would have a practical entrepreneurial experience before they graduate. That's not 50%, that's 100%. And if we're going to get there, we have to get to 50. So this thing about penetration and how many students in a school or how many students at the end of a cycle, three years in secondary school or in vet, how many actually graduate having had this kind of grit experience, we have to know that. It's the only way also to break through this Chinese wall between teachers who do this and teachers who don't do this. So it seemed in this case that they broke through that barrier and instead of having just one or two teachers involved in this kind of exercise, they managed to involve you know, more than half or three quarters of the faculty at the school. Teachers are the key. You have said it here more than a dozen times. Um, they are the multipliers. Teachers were much more positive about this kind of learning after this experience than before. So it's important to kill the idea that by, by investing more in this, you're, you're taking away investment from something else. It is not true. It's actually uh, adding value. It's not a cost to the way the schools are running. It's not a negative impact on the school environment. It is quite the opposite. And I think another point we need to remember about building these kinds of competences is that it is a transversal one. It does travel across all the subject areas, across all the types of uh, fields of endeavor. It's a huge value to people, as individuals, but it's also to society, to learning pathways, to any career and any kind of organization. If we want our governments to be better, if we want our NGOs to be better, if we want our civil society to be better, then we really need to remember that this belongs in every stream. Um, it also complements learning in other areas, as the research has shown us. It's relevant to any age. Many people tell me, what are you saying? You're doing this in primary school. I say, yes, there's a lot of entrepreneurial learning. We're not talking about creating necessarily a company when people are eight years old, but we are talking to them about how communities work and how things are organized and the roles people play and how teams can be built and how responsibility works. They, they love that. And that's what we mean. Um, Blanca shared with me some of the results that she has worked on here in Spain. And it reinforced, it was not one of, Spain was not one of the countries in the research that I've talked to you about, but she said that they got very similar results. 20% increase in academic performance. 30% of the students had higher expectations to continue in, in education. 30% showed more interest in civic engagement. 
31% higher spirit of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial spirit. Absenteeism went down by 30%, and the non-cognitive skills ranged, depending on the age, uh, age group, ranged between 23 and 62% increase. And she also said, and I think this is great, that it had a major impact on the most disadvantaged or the most vulnerable students. So, you might not be able to see the fine print, but at the top, we're talking about a progression model, and this is very, very important in developing competence-based learning, right? At a young age, you start here, you build mastery over time, and you come out at the end with, we hope, this magic um, mixture of, of strength in, in, in these desirable competences. We talk about discovering in primary school, discovering, exploring, then as you get older, experimenting, and then you dare and then you persist as you move all the way into creating real enterprises. Um, we focus on cluster of competences around entrepreneurship, work readiness, and financial literacy. And we, we talk about the focus in terms of their learning scope, community, wider community, national focus, building independence, and then we use the word the real thing where you're really creating uh, real enterprises uh, and the outcome being entrepreneurship and value creation. It's really about value creation. Civic engagement would be strong value creation just as much as creating a successful business. Um, do we have anybody in the commission still in the room? Yes, okay. Well, on the left-hand side here, something you might recognize, the entrepreneurship competence framework was designed in order to help education systems, educators, and policymakers to understand what are the key areas, learning outcomes that we need to focus on um, in the different. For example, you need to have capability around ideas and opportunities. You need to have capability around taking ideas into action and you need to have capability in resources and surroundings. So you need to be very resourceful. And the, this is a very high level summary of all of the learning outcomes because there's something like 485, so it's just a high level summary. But what we're looking at is different programs, mapping those programs and the content and the syllabus against those highly desirable outcomes. Uh, is the content that we have and the tools that we have, is it aligned with this or not? Is it strong? Is it weak? Where is it strong? Where is it weak? And trying to improve content that, and training for teachers, adjusting that, adapting that, so that we actually do deliver. You don't just keep doing the same kind of thing uh, year in, year out. You actually must adjust content for the times. This was an example of a program at... Uh, for example, middle school level, just to give you an example. I think another, another thing that is very important is kind of where young people are this, these days too, micro-credentials. Young people will have personal profiles. They're going to develop their own, they probably won't call it a CV, they'll call it something else, but it's them, it's theirs and it's what they're going to use to get jobs, it's what they're going to use to go forward in life, and they're going to get those micro-credentials wherever they can get them. They'll get degrees, they'll get certificates, they'll get whatever they can in order to build their personal profile to show um, uh, potential employers, but the world, what it is that they like, what it is they're good at, and what it is they've done. But there's nothing, very, very little out there for teenagers especially around these grit competence like entrepreneurship. So we created the Entrepreneurial Skills Pass in cooperation with the European uh, Commission. Under, in those days, it was under Da Vinci, well, before Erasmus time, but we created this Entrepreneurial Skills Pass. And this is for young people specifically who've gone through this deep dive entrepreneurship experience. And when they do that, and they complete a self-assessment, and they do a final exam that shows they've got those competences, they have this knowledge, then they get their entrepreneurial skills passed. It's quite unique, 
but it's a competence that is high demand uh, in, the, in the labor market today. 28 countries right now are running this, 22 languages. We want to do a lot more to develop this. We think we can learn so much more about what motivates the young people, what they're getting from this, how they're using this. We can also get a lot of longitudinal data from it as we look back over the years at the students who have participated. This is also very important. Where did they end up? Where do they go later? Um, and one of the things we're observing is that there's quite a new generation of entrepreneurs coming up. I mean, you see them, what they're focused on. For, first of all, they're focused on very highly innovative, high-tech businesses, many of them, uh, uh, apps or, or high-tech in biomedical technology or green tech or you name it, but a lot of it is extremely high innovation, high growth sectors, but they're also focused on val their own values. What matters to them, sustainability, the SDGs, all of that, that's what they're trying to integrate in their companies. So for example, I'll mention uh, Carolee Hindrick, the blonde in the second from the right, she's from Estonia. And she runs a company called Jobatical.com. You might want to look into her because she's, she's doing matching, find people who have tech talent, matching them with companies who need tech talent. She works between Asia and Europe, and it's just amazing, this platform that she's created. And it's all because she saw this gig economy coming. She saw all these young people with really cool talents, and they had not um, uh, done enough. Oops. Then we have... Uh, for example, Boris Polev, he's the one in the middle, he's Bulgarian. He runs a company called Digimark. And he uh, started uh, his work in uh, coding when he was 13. Um, and then he founded his first company when he was uh, 18. Um, and he was extremely successful marketing this business. He went international very quickly. And he became um, uh, Europe's best young entrepreneur in 2007. But one of the things he's trying to do now with his money that he's earned is he's trying to go back and help other young entrepreneurs in Bulgaria to start up, to set up. So he's giving back in very interesting ways. It, and in the old days, many entrepreneurs would be extremely focused on their own stuff and on their own success, but he actually half of his time is spent on trying to share his success with others. Claudia Suhov, she's Romanian. She started a company called Kidster, and it offers educational programs for students in different cities in Romania for uh, young, young children, and especially in these very uh, deprived areas, small villages in uh, the eastern part of Romania. And Christian Erfurt on the right, he's the founder of Be My Eyes. Uh, he started uh, playing, uh, playing soccer at a very young age. He was really into that, typical, typical kid, but then he was diagnosed with cancer. So he's a cancer survivor, I think two or three times. Um, and he decided to set up a medical services company at the age of 18 as a result of his entrepreneurship education experience. And it's just an app which helps the blind people find people who can help them lead them around, especially in environments where they don't know, uh, they don't know the location. Um, it's a very simple uh, technology, but it is something that uh, now is being picked up by a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of companies in order to find what they call sighted volunteers or people locally who will help the blind. And it was considered uh, one of the top best Google apps in 2017. So I just wanted to share some of the entrepreneurs who, who are really thinking about what kind of, what are my values, what's important to me, so then what's the kind of business I want to create. So I'll just leave you with a couple of remarks. One is that deep dive, high intensity experiences matter. Uh, light touch, it's not going to do enough. We have to do that deep dive experiences. We've also seen there is a big connection between learning these competences and performing better uh, as, as uh, civic engagement in society. Investment in education, however, in Europe continues to drop. And we know that for continents like Europe, that is not a good thing. We need to invest in our human capital. 
Businesses want to worry to uh, partner with schools, but they worry about the complexity of the system. And schools want to partner with businesses, but they worry that they don't have enough time. So this brokering of partnerships, multiplying of partnerships is extremely important. And the last is, even though I told you about a lot of individual stories here, like those four young entrepreneurs, the data, big data, more research, impact information on this kind of education is what's going to move the policymakers forward. So I think we really need to spend a lot of time on that because it's going to impact the SDGs. The level of penetration today is already being impactful in the economy in a number of countries, and we need to do that even more. So we want businesses to say at the end that this is one of the most cost-effective investments they could make and that they had higher ROI by doing this than by waiting to do it later. Thank you very much.